to myself, Max McGillivray from Beanstalk. I'm very proud today to uh, be having our second food service broadcast uh, in association with Peter Backman and powered by uh, Total Produce Food Service. So, Peter, say hello to everyone. Hello, everybody. Um, you'll hear, be hearing quite a lot from me um, over the next hour or so. Um, so uh, I won't say anything more right now. Uh, I'll hand back to Max and he can ask the questions. I'm going to embarrass Peter because I always, always like doing, doing this bit because he's, he's such a, a modest individual. Peter is an expert commentator on the structure and dynamics of the food service sector and its supply chain in the UK and internationally. If you've been involved in the food sector, I'm sure that you will have um, um, either seen his uh, weekly reports or um, he, he's speaking at various conferences again in the UK or um, uh, internationally. He's been involved as a, as a researcher, consultant within the sector for over 30 years, blending his knowledge with a deep understanding of the trends, key players and challenges of organisations with an interest in that in food service. Um, and if you're watching this on the, on the record, have a look at the bottom because we'll um, tag Peter's uh, website so you can have a, a, a look at uh, some of the work that he's done and also catch up with the likes of his uh, weekly reports. Peter and I were, were very keen to um, set this food service broadcast up because, oh, what, what a time to, to set it up um, and that we were very keen to create the conversation around food service and not just be part of it. We had a very successful first broadcast uh, with uh, Peter, they're amazing, weren't they? Um, Tony Reynolds of the, of the Reynolds Group and uh, 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 James Lipscomb of uh, the Ch Chesterford Group. That's um, so, so we've got a, um, a very, with Tony, a very big um, food service, fresh produce player. And James runs this amazing uh, fish and chip empire. I, I don't think he would like me to use the word, but it's something like 22, 24 fish and chip shops. And it's, it's fascinating here, hearing from both of them as to how they developed their business as they went through this, oh, this incredible oddity that is um, 2020. <laughs> For, for this broadcast, we wanted to major on what we've learned from the lockdown periods and how the sector can now positively bounce back from Christmas 2020 and beyond. And to assist us with, with that, we've um, we brought in uh, two other experts um, over and above um, Peter, who really got their, their feet on the ground as to what is going on within their specific areas of, of food service. And Peter's very kindly going to inter interview them, Peter, but it's probably too strong a word, it's, it's to have a, a long form conversation, have a, have a conversation with them to, to for, for all of us to learn from them as to what they've learned in, in the role per se up to present day, but also what they've learned in 2020 and how they've managed to develop their, their businesses. So, so Peter, give us a little bit more of a background on, on yourself over and above my, my gl glitzy start for you, please. Well, you've done it. Um, uh, that's it. Um, I'm, uh, I know about food service and, and the whole thing from uh, Wormwood Scrubs to the Ritz and the supply chain and it, with an international um, competence. Um, I'm doing some work in India at the moment and France. Um, I'm, I'm looking particularly at restaurant delivery, because that prior to COVID wow. and during COVID has been disrupting the market. So there are all sorts of different aspects of food service that really um, are worth noting and, and really interest me. And one thing that always strikes me about this industry is um, it's full of nice people you've got to be nice in order to work in the food service sector because it's all about hospitality if you don't have that gene then then um you've got, you find it much more difficult because at heart it's all about making people feel um pleasant so uh, and and that's one reason why i'm i'm heavily involved in this sector peter because yeah as we spoke uh, before you, you could have gone off in uh, any any different direction, couldn't you? Especially like on a, on a scientific basis. But your love is is the, the sector and the, and the people people within it. Yes. Yeah, so well, you know, um, I sort of fell into it, um, but I I quickly realised that yes, it is. It's full of nice people. Um, uh, I trained as a scientist, which I can't say they're not nice people. <laughs> I tend to be a bit more buttoned up than than people yep. in the food service sector. Um, and that was fine, but working in a laboratory with test tubes, um, I realised wasn't for me. Um, far better to uh, smell the food and eat it. Yeah, well, well said. My, my father was a, a doctor of biochemistry, so I've, I've obviously missed the genes in the respect of the intelligence. But yes, I, I, I couldn't. Uh, I needed to do do some, something more, more practical. 
So, so Peter, before we um, get into it, because I've got a, oh, I've got a big question to ask of you. We we must just re remember that we wouldn't be able to be running this uh, broadcast if it wasn't for our partners for today. Uh, Total Produce, Total Produce PLC. If you're not aware of them, is to, to, is today one of the world's largest and most accomplished fresh produce producers and providers. They're local at Tar, global by nature, and they operate out of would you believe 30 countries uh, while serving many more. Uh, the industry-leading vertical integrated supply chain extends across the globe, incorporating over 260 facilities. So they've got 260 standalone businesses on a, on a global basis, including farms, vessels, manufacturing facilities, cold storage, warehousing and, uh, and pack housing. And what's great about them as a business is that their range extends from the more familiar to the truly exotic within, within fresh, uh, fresh produce. But they, they want to be a local, seen as a, as a local business. So we're very proud to have them uh, again uh, partnering us for, for this uh, for this second uh, broadcast. And if you have a look at the Total Produce website, you'll be able to see your local regional supplier um, to see whether you can uh, engage with them. So, so Peter, just um, oh, how, how much of a hound dog day is to, to today? Um, in that it uh, doesn't today feel a bit like March 23rd when we went into first lockdown and we got all the conversations about uh, London potentially going into um, tier, tier three and two thirds of the country going into tier three. We just seem to be going round and round in circles. What, what, what are you thinking? Do, do you think we're in this constant grand hog day and are we ever going to get out of it, especially in the, in the respect of food service? Well, yeah, I mean, if you look at it particularly from a, um, a food service perspective, I guess... Um, it's not quite the same as March the 23rd because we've learned, um, we've operated through the early, the, the first lockdown, which sort of ended in June. Um, then things started opening up and um, there was a certain amount of um, uh, confidence in the market. Then the, the autumn started hitting, then the numbers started rising. So then we had lockdown in November. And now in this month, we've, for two thirds of the country, have got full lockdown um, in terms of the food service market in particular, um, by which I mean you basically can't go and eat out. You can have food delivered, but you can't eat out or you can, you can go and take away food. Um, uh, and the, the rest of the country can still serve food, except for a tiny portion of the market, which is more or less open. The rest of the country has to stop serving food at 11 o'clock in the evening. So there are restrictions. So this is different, both on the basis that we've had experience and that we, we are, um, um, the, the food service market is one of those markets that is, is um, has been highlighted for, for being locked down. Um, if, you, if you talk from this position about the future, um, then um, we're in for a very tricky time, in my view, still for the next few months. Um, how long this lockdown lasts, I don't know. Um, I've, I've been hearing about, you know, going on into January and even beyond, which doesn't strike me as being, being beyond the bounds of possibility. And at the same time, um, we're, we're starting to get the vaccines coming along. So we've got a, a situation where uh, we're being um, assailed by, by growing numbers um, of, of how the COVID is hitting us, more hospitalizations, regrettably more deaths. Um, and at the same time, we've got um, increased hope, um, more people being um, uh, vaccinated against the, uh, the virus. So these two things are sort of working against each other. Um, when do they cross over? In other words, when, when, when do we sort of effectively get out of this dreadful period? Um, well, if I had to put money on it, and bearing in mind, um, like everybody else, I've been turned into an expert epidemiologist in the last few months. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm talking as if I really know what's going on. My, but my view is late spring will start to feel quite comfortable, and but things won't be getting back to normal growth until the autumn. 
Yeah, I, I agree, Peter. So, so what, what I'm picking up is that on a business perspective is that uh, um, a, a number of business organizations are, are saying that the end of Q1, Q2 of, of next year, we're going to see this uptick because prior to the uh, pandemic, there was nothing fundamentally wrong with the UK economy. Um, so if we can, uh, if the vaccine comes through, um, we, we will see a rapid um, re return to normal in the respect of, uh, of, of businesses. So we will see a, an, an uptick. And I, I suppose it's... Uh, it, the, the pertinent element on the lights of food services is, is, um, the, is the light at the end of the tunnel in, in the short term and perhaps the long term, as we were just discussing in our green room before we went live live, is that how um, businesses and um, the, the takeout market may, may be a, a direction and avenue that they're, that they're going to go into. Um, and I suppose that comes back to um, our topic uh, title about what have we learned from these lockdown periods and how the sector can now positively bounce back from, from uh, Christmas 2000 yeah. and, uh, and, and beyond. Um, Peter, would it be an idea if we um, uh, invite our experts um, um, in so we could just uh, get, get, find out who they are? And then if, you, if you'd like to um, take it away then, Peter, and um, so shall we go with George well, first after we got, got them to, 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 to introduce themselves and we can hear about their businesses? Now, uh, would you like to come, as, come in as well? Sure. Yeah. Uh, George, let's just start, start with you. Could, could you give us a, a little bit of a, of a background as to who, who you are? Who is the handsome man that is George Beach? Oh, that's so kind, Max. Hello, everybody. Um, so, yeah, my name is George Beach. I run a small but growing family business based in Warwickshire. We're farmers and growers as our sort of base. And then we've developed the brand that you can see behind me, Mud Walls Follow the Flavour, over the last 10 years into quite an exciting project. Um, we supply a number of retailers, uh, wholesalers, a uh, small amount of restaurants, and we also supply into those that do supply restaurants and um, various food service businesses. And uh, our scope is a, a range of fresh produce through to fine foods. Fantastic. Thank you, George. Now, Lafar, from, from your front room, from your, uh, from, from your uh, dining room at home, please could you tell us a, a little bit about your, yourself and your fantastic business? Hello, uh, my name is Neela Farkhan. Uh, I'm from Zabadazd. And Zabadas is an Indian wrap company serving Indian food with the uh, biryanis and curries, etc. We have a hub and spoke model. We've got eight stores, some in London, some in suburbs as well. And uh, we produce everything centrally and distribute out to the uh, stores. And uh, primarily it was lunchtime business, but it's the evening business and breakfast as well. Fantastic. And everyone you must look at both of the, the, the websites and if you're looking at the record or listening on the podcast um, have a look at the, the websites because they're two br brilliant websites and you'll find out so much more about their businesses over and above uh, the chat that Peter's going to have with them so, so Peter would you like to have a, a conversation with George so we can find out more about uh, about George from from your perspective please Peter and another fire if, if you and I if we if we just duck out and we'll, we'll let the gentleman get on with it <laughs> hello Peter hi hi George um so uh, you've you've explained a little bit about your business. Um, um, we've got about seven or eight minutes, I guess, to to just uh, investigate just a little bit more. Um, can you very briefly tell me, you know, where it comes from, how it was set up, that sort of thing? Yeah, very much so. Um, so I started my career um, working for Tesco's, uh, learning all about fresh produce, and I was very interested in the quality of products. So I've spent quite a lot of time looking at quality and, and had a great opportunity, thanks to my job at Tesco, to visit many, many farms of fresh produce around the country and further afield. Um, carried on my career through coming out of Tesco, working in supply chain from all angles, mainly bringing fresh fruit into the UK um, and spreading fruit from around the UK farmers to various companies. Um, my business sort of grew and grew in the form of um, uh, fresh but then I, I realized that actually beyond fresh fr fruit and vegetables there's some absolutely fantastic producers of fine foods so here we are today supplying a range of fine foods as well as fresh produce to quite a wide range of markets um, the base of the business as I said earlier is, is a farm in Warwickshire so we, we, we know all about farming and growing, so we have good empathy with those, uh, that end of the market, as well as understanding how to get the product from the field um, to the plate. Great. Um, so um, roughly what sort of size is the business? Go, go, give me some, some measure. 
Okay, well, the farm, the farm itself is a, is a modest 250 acre fruit and vegetable farm, um, which uh, has been in, the, in my father's control for, for many, many years. Um, we've sort of grown the business from, from a very small uh, enterprise that I decided to set up on my own uh, 10 years ago. Uh, we're now uh, sort of heading towards a double figure million turnover and uh, have great plans to expand that further. Mm, great. Um, so I, I just wonder if we can turn the clock back to the beginning part of the year um, and if, if you can sort of revisit that and what, what did the world feel like for you at that particular time? Okay, so we're talking about March, April time. Uh, so if we go right to the beginning, uh, you know, went into January uh, ready with our sleeves rolled up for a, for, a, for a sort of reasonably good step up in growth. Um, we did our budgeting and our forecasting for, for a reasonable growth, but not too, too aggressive. Um, and then, uh, you know, as we all well know, um, things started to change and um, we all started to feel the uncertainty, I guess, of what the business is going to look like. Um, We've been very fortunate in our business that um, sort of the biggest part of the business was very focused on retail and convenience retail. So we, although we have uh, customers in the food service world, we were very fortunate that we had a, a, a foot in the camp of retail. Um, we could see very, very quickly that the, um, the lockdowns, the, the worries, the panics were meaning that people were not going into restaurants, not going into major retailers. And actually that local convenience store was the busy one. Um, so we had, we had a sort of forecast of a plan that we were going to be supplying a number of these independent uh, and groups of small convenience stores and suddenly realized that actually what we were doing was a sort of niche high end level of product um, with interesting and different products. But very quickly, we started to find ourselves being asked to get into the volume main sort of lines, the simple lines, the cucumbers, the, the lettuce, all those things that suddenly became very difficult to find just because there was chaos. There was chaos everywhere. Um, so we, we realized that actually the, the, the volume of that product um, that was destined for food service um, was, was being sort of held up in cold stores and warehouses with, with no real home. However, the problem was that all of that product was all in, in effect a bulk format in a format suitable for chefs, not suitable for retailers. So we uh, found ourselves communicating to some of the large food service companies that ended up having more stock than they had sales. Um, unfortunately, we were very lucky to turn that stock into retailable stock. So loose product, we pre-packed. Um, we had to change some of the SKU sizes to fit some of the products. So actually, I guess we came with a, a little white flag waving to say, do you know what? If you can't sell that to the restaurants, uh, I think we've got a place we can put that into retail. So for me, that opened a whole scope of opportunity um, and hopefully did sort of help a number of those that were not as lucky as we were. Mm. Um, I, I guess it, it's... Uh, correct, um, you know, put me right if it isn't, to, to refer to your business as a sort of a family business, although not a time. No, 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 very much. Our, our business has been born on, on a family business. My father um, has been the grower and I was always very much more interested in marketing. And then the upshot is that we ended up working together. So he would grow the product in effect and I would sell it. Um, so we absolutely have been born from a family business. Um, but because of the way we've been fortunate to build the business, we are growing, um, but our values and our men, uh, you know, our, our, our values and the way we work in the business is very, very much on a sort of very close family way. Um, as we grow, we have to become a little bit more corporate and, and understand uh, how you have to be in a larger company. Um, and and in, in the last few months, we have taken the company to another level um, and we have merged in, in, into another bigger business. And, and that means that we, we have to function differently, but our values definitely do not change. So, it, um, so it, in a nutshell, during that difficult period, it, it was a family pulling together, wasn't it? 
Yeah, it was. It was very, very much like that. Um, I have two young sons who one's at university studying agricultural engineering and the other one was just sort of coming out of his travel period and, and actually decided to come home rather than take his travels further. And uh, as a family, we, we, we pulled together and we did, we did actually have a period of time when we were realizing that our business is growing and we were being quite successful. And I sat back and thought, you know what? We need to share some of this success. And there's a huge amount of people out there, the vulnerables, the not so well off, those losing their jobs, those being furloughed, those that couldn't get out into town and do shopping. So my two sons uh, helped me and we pulled together huge amounts of packages and parcels. And we, we did a great job of delivering little friendly gift parcels to a number of the vulnerable and not so well off. So I, I felt really proud that those two came back home. One drove the van, one did the packing. Um, and, and yeah, we pulled together and, 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 and just, just did what good families do and realized that, yeah, we're doing quite well, but we need to help those that are not. Um, very important values. Um, George, can I ask you to um, hide yourself and, and I'll ask Nilifer to come, come into the room and we yeah, can sure. carry on our chat. Hi, Nilifer. Hello, Peter. Um, so I'm, I'm going to broadly ask you sort of similar background questions, if I may. Um, sure. Just give me a little bit of an idea about the the gen how Zabadas arrived in the world. Right. So uh, in 2013, when the world was again changing and uh, we uh, and the a lot of different uh, way of uh, people eating habits were coming on board, we decided to launch an Indian wrap company. So where there's a participation of the customer. So customer can customize their own bread and then salad and then the sauces and then we toast and away they go. So we started that with one store up in Waterloo and very quickly it just took off from there. But having said that, prior to that, I have uh, had a restaurant since 2003. And uh, so we had some old homemade recipes that we still use till today. And uh, the whole idea was to bring what we eat at home to bring it onto the market so that Indian food is eaten in a different light as well, different manner and started at lunchtime. And of course we have products and um, offers for the evening and the breakfast. Um, incidentally, um, anybody listening who wants to eat at Zabadas, uh, I can really uh, recommend, uh, recommend the, the food. So find, find one um, and, and, and eat there. But um, um, Nirafa, um, how how big is Zabadast, or what, um, if we go, you know, however you want to measure it, uh, how mm -hmm. many stores have you got, that sort of thing? So, so we've got one central kitchen, CPU, and then we've got eight stores. And in fact, the last one opened uh, during this COVID period as well in August. And so uh, currently we have eight and, uh, and a CPU, and it's a sub 5 million turnover. And, and, and they're all located in London? So they are, uh, yes, yeah, so Greater London as well. So the furthest out is a Blue Water Shopping Centre, which is in Kent, but otherwise it's London and then near Catrum and Croydon, Canary Wharf, Clerkenwell, Bankside, Waterloo. Mm. And so it, again, um, like I, I said to George, if, if, we, if we can just sort of transport ourselves back to January, February of this year, what was the world looking like for you? Well, Peter, uh, the whole of 2019, once we had tried and tested for a few years uh, our offer, we had great, great plans to go national and international. And I say we had, I mean, we still have, but again, as a small business, we had to pivot towards uh, survival and survival not just of ourselves and a family, but survival of the business, the whole Zabadas family, i.e. the team and uh, suppliers, et cetera, et cetera. So what, uh, we had those plans and we were in conversations with some absolutely great partners and we still are, but then uh, came March, March 23rd. Mm. And very quickly, we were, uh, we were wondering what to do, but very quickly we had to change uh, the, and navigate through the troubled waters. 
And uh, I'm very happy to say that we're still alive and well and surviving. And uh, not just on the business front, but health-wise on a family personal front as well, touch wood. Yeah, I mean, you've mentioned family a couple of times and, and I had a word That's with uh, um, George about it as well. So uh, yours is very much a family business, isn't it? Yes, it is. So it's my husband and myself and my sons have been brought up with, uh, with us working. So my husband is part-time because he has uh, he's a technologist and he's got other interests so mainly myself uh, but a very much uh, family yes and our eldest son comes in and out but they all have their own careers but they're all there to support mom mm. <laughs> <laughs> yes so um uh, if, if if we look back over the last few months um ha has the, the dreadful circumstances we've been in has it influenced the way that you look at the world um the world of business or, or the wider world yes it has peter in the sense that uh it's i think it's reinforced our thinking that we should all be working with each other rather than just for ourselves and uh having sat back all through those April, May and June ones when we were all struggling. And fortunately, we were very fortunate to have landed some NHS contracts where uh, that gave us some space to rethink and uh, recalibrate our uh, bandwidth and our minds. And uh, so we, we said, yes, we have to expand and we have to help each other, but we have to work with each other rather than just work for ourselves. And, uh, and our model changed slightly rather than just having London centric stores we've started opening in suburbs as well and within the lockdown we were able to open one in August. Yes I mean I think it's um, quite um, quite important that businesses like yours have been able or been first of all willing and then able to to think um, strategically, i.e., mm -hmm. let's open another store um, in uh, during this period, um, and I think that m that must be a, um, a an important consideration in, I guess, for any business. Yes, it is. It is very uh, very important consideration. But then, uh, because bearing in mind, we still have all those um, rental debts, etc just rent mainly, uh, that government has not done anything about to help uh, so far. So those will come uh, in 2021, 22 and beyond. So uh, the businesses are having conversations with the landlords, etc. And fortunately, we are moving in the right direction, mm -hmm. but we have to think strategically. We can't just, uh, what we've built up, we can't let it go. Although it is, it is tough and the mindset themselves, we have to think about that look, this is what's happening to us, but then we are still far better off than many, many, many others. And we can't give up. We can't give up for the sake of ourselves and for the sake of the whole Zabadis uh, team as well. Um, well. Maybe we can come on to this um, later on when, when, when we meet up in, in the bigger room with, with Max and George, but it seems to me that there are a, a, a number of themes have come through from what, what we've been talking about. First of all, there's the importance of family. Um, secondly, caring for employees and, and caring for other people, which I think Community. is a, a core value for people in the food service industry, uh, other industries as well, but particularly for, for the food service industry. And it's easy, I think, to forget that in the hurly-burly of, of just driving mm. driving forward and and trying to get business and so on hmm. people are important aren't they people are very important without people we're nothing no we, we just can't do this ourselves and people are important and then don't forget that those people are not just the names on their payroll etc they have got families themselves and they have got people they might be uh, servicing and helping not just here but abroad etc as well and and in in uk so okay, you can put them on furlough, but for you know for a short period of time, but mm -hmm. then you have to innovate, and the innovation has to come from up top. They they need to be guided. They need to be given that vision. They need to be uh, told that yes, where it's okay, it's going to be fine, 
And we are fortunate also, Peter, that um, we have been speaking about, I mean, I'll tell you that we've been looking at the central, uh, changing our CPU, central processing uh, manufacturing unit for eight, nine months now. And in February, we were going to sign a contract, but then everything happened. But we're very fortunate that we did sign and the fit out has started. We signed uh, about four weeks ago, fit out started. And in January, hopefully, we shall be moving to our new unit and opening another one in February, a uh, small suburban and, unit. And what does the CPU, operation as a CPU, actually mean for your business? So what that means is it opens up huge uh, number of opportunities, i.e. for the expansion uh, beyond uh, 2021. It also will be creating more jobs as well. And uh, it's given us uh, opportunity to get the teams together to innovate, innovate and pivot ourselves for the home delivery service, which is what we've been focusing on as well, because our customers are not coming. We've always been customer centric. So customers are not coming to us. We will go to the customers. And that's why we have focused on the home delivery. And that's why the suburban suburb dusts are popping up because our customers are living in suburbs. So we've come to them, not in Canary yeah. Wharf or London. So, so central unit will now give us opportunity to go up to 60 or so as other dust. That's fantastic. Um, hope for the future then. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So maybe we'll invite um, George uh, and uh, Max back into the room and um, we can open up um, a bit more of a discussion. Um, first of all, I, I'm, I'm hoping this will be a bit of a... Um, it's not just going to be a question of me asking questions and other people answering them, but maybe we can have a bit of a cross conversation going on as well, um, if there are points of interest. Um, but let me just start by, by um, posing the question, um, particularly to Nilofar and George, what, what has the last, or what have the last nine months or so taught you? What lessons have you learned or a lesson that you've learned? Um, I, I'll have a go at answering that. I think I think one of the lessons is that um, we can do a lot more than we ever thought we could do. Uh, we can be a lot more efficient than ever we thought we could be. Um, the pressure of the whole scenario with whatever we're doing, um, it has been quite immense. And I think that in, in any business, not just our own, uh, it's amazing what you can do under pressure. And I think that's one of the lessons. And with everybody now working from home uh, and, and the whole change is making us all think much, much more about um, where we spend our time. Um, but I, I, I think one of the biggest lessons for me really is, is that we, we really can do some stuff if we try. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I would 100% agree with that. Uh, I would say that it's basically it's uh, restored the faith in humanity in the sense that you know human beings are so strong and when you put your mind to it there are so many things you can think outside the box and really get going that was one thing another thing is that community local communities are just so so important whether it's uh, from support point of view whether it's marketing point of view whether it's any other just living point of view i have found that local community is something uh, which is extremely important mm. Hey Peter, can I just cut cut across you because I just had a really interesting question on the from a, from a contact on, on WhatsApp, and I'm going to ask all, all three of you the, the, the same question. Um, but for, for George and Nilifar, can I just have a one word answer? George, did you ever think about giving up this year? No. Nilifar. No. Peter. No. P Peter, with your client base, you know you've got an extensive client base. Have, have you seen this resilience all the way through? Or let's be realistic, have some people fallen by the way and look to do other things because it, 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 it's just been so emotional and so financially draining on them? Um, I, I don't, well, I, I know a lot, of, I've seen an awful lot of resilience. I, I know a lot of people who have regrettably failed, but I don't think any of them have failed through lack of a desire, lack of will uh, or anything like that. It's, it's the money, basically. Yeah. Or, and um, I think that that's um, that's what I've seen. Um, mm. So yeah, I mean, I, this this notion of resilience, I, th I think, has been very important throughout the throughout the yeah. sector. 
Um, can, I, can I just say something? Yes, of course. Yeah. Go, no, no, go, yeah. go, go, go. Uh, what I would say there, Max, is also that once there is an entrepreneurship, entrepreneurism inside inside a person, the circumstances may make it very tough, uh, and then you may have to stop. But then it won't go away from within you. It you will pop up back again. You will definitely come back again. That's what I would say. Mm. George, would you agree? Yeah, wholeheartedly. Um, I, I I just think that actually, um, the the amount of effort that not not just in in our entrepreneurialism but within the teams you know i think people have recognized particularly in our world how difficult it is for a lot of friends and family so it just sort of makes you get grip and 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 really get stuck in you know we we've just been talking as a team about our holidays and how many holidays we haven't had and how much extra work people have done and you know i am so pleased with the sort of general feeling from the teams about you know we've just got to knuckle down and do it which it really does help us yeah it's been very good and and, and peter don't you think that both of these individuals especially nelifar are, are actually creating a, a revolution as when, when you I've, I've learned so much from, from today and i'll see if i can try and articulate it if you remember back to our parents generation we had nothing like drive through mcdonald's nothing like drive through costa coffees nothing like out of town shopping centers N now we we have and there's now a revolution um, being created on the on the restaurant uh, scene that we don't want to go out, but we still want to eat. So as Nilof, I said, the, the, the food's got to got to come to us. I'm fascinated by um, Nilof, the, the expression I've always picked up is the, is the dark store. Uh, so it's a bit like mm. um, T Tesco's having having a um, a dark store for all the online um, online orders. And, and I I had picked up that there are more restaurants going down that way. You, you seem to be an innovator in the first place. Have already created your and um, what did you call it again? Your CPU. Yes, that's right. The uh, the uh, uh, the hub hub of yeah. cooking. Yeah. So, so, so can, that's can, what, I, can I pick up on that? Because uh, I, I just talk about delivery in general. Um, uh, you you mentioned Nilafel before that um, delivery was something that you were working working towards. We hear stories about commission rates and not knowing who the customer is and so on. Um, um, either despite that you're moving ahead or you're finding ways around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, that's a very good point. Yes, uh, so the commission rates of these different aggregators are really, really crippling, especially when we know the margins are very tight in the in the food business, so uh, uh, and the home delivery business. So uh, we have the way uh, we have done and addressed that is to have our own e-commerce system as well as using the aggregators and within the aggregators the other uh, other thing we are trying and testing is using our own delivery drivers so that halves the uh, commission rates as well but uh, coming back to to the dark store i personally uh, and it's all good and fine having dark store but i i love the whole reason why we got into the food business was to be able to see people talk to people touch people have the community so eventually we would have combination of both. I don't think we should at all have completely dark store and boarded up high streets, uh, not at all. They, uh, they, it will reform, it will innovate, it will change, but we should not go away from uh, having the uh, either coffee house or restaurants or uh, yeah. uh, pubs, etc. but where the people can come in. But don't, I think, you, think, don't you think, yeah. sorry. It's all right, Peter, no, go on. Now I was going to say, don't you think that um, people will naturally create their own needs and, and solutions for hospitality? Uh, things think, will close down, but they will come back up again. I think, well, uh, yeah, I think what's going to happen is that inevitably, um, as we've just been talking about, people, you have to take things to people because they can't get to the restaurant and they're not allowed to go to the restaurant and so on. And I think what's going to happen is that that will inevitably all being well we get the vaccines going and everyone starts to come back but i think actually there's going to be a sudden surge once we are able to come back and i think those restaurants that can and are able to open again um, have got to probably rethink the offer in terms of the way that you are 
um, the, the sort of experience that you have. Um, I think this, this sort of combination of retail and restaurant, lack of activity in the high street, all these different things that are going on. I think what we're going to see over the next year or two is a new style of high street, a new way of shopping. Um, there's no doubt online shopping uh, and, and something that we've got heavily involved in. We've now set up our own partnership to supply fresh produce, fresh meat and fresh fish to the home. And I, and, and I no doubt that is going to grow. That's going to continue to grow. And it, it will only grow with those that do a good job. Um, what we have seen is a lot of food service companies inevitably change their business from being a typical uh, supplier into a restaurant. And, and they've managed to bring together some fantastic food box offices, uh, off, offers, um, of which some have been great, some have been successful. And unfortunately, some of them have fallen apart because uh, the, the whole structure of that business is massively different and there's a massive cost different. Um, so I think online shopping for great food uh, ha has a long, long life ahead of it. I think that possibly a combination of those doing online food shopping should consolidate and probably will inevitably link with good restaurants. And I see some great synergies between what we're doing delivering great food to the home. I think there will be synergies with us and some great restaurants. I think we can combine our, our, our working relationships and probably offer a, a service to help um, uh, Nifar the same way that you're having to do it yourself. I think there's a future where, where businesses like ours can, can probably help do that. And then I see the actual retail environment being different. You know, we, we've seen the Costas and the pret a mangers and all those sort of things they've been fabulous but i i see it as a as a as a different sort of model going forward i can see the whole sort of part shopping part eating um environment that that sort of encourages you to eat with us today but also take something home the same for tomorrow and i see that growing can, can i just make a point about the, the delivery service because again i'm learning so much from this no you, you mentioned about the well, I've got to say it. So, on on your behalf, the, the scandalous prices that the the the, uh, the, the delivery firms um, charge. If you look at the lights of Right Move um, in the estate agency sector, um, I think it was in 2018 they turned over 160 million in gross sales, and they made 120 million gross profit. Um, because they managed to capture the market and the estate agency sector was uh, was too slow to, to react. Um, it it's all, almost feels like if, if it's not controlled, if the likes of yourself are, are, are not being disruptive and doing what you're doing and going to the consumer direct, that you're going to have this, the, the, the sector is going to have the same issue, that you're going to have these middlemen who um, are going to um, take you by, by hostage because it's the only way that you can get to get to the con consumer. So for you to be disruptive and, and set up your own uh, fleet, fleet of vehicles and go direct and, and look to use that community support, especially because it's completely, completely genuine. But yeah, it would seem a bit of a worry that those delivery f firms uh, potentially will just look to ride and ride this and, and, and get a, 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 a stranglehold on, on that delivery sector. Um, mm -hmm. what, what would you think? Well, I would say I'll give you an example and uh, give you a little uh, scenario, really, that uh, for, say, for Zabadast, for ourselves, uh, we were doing 10% of our uh, sales was through the delivery in Uber Eats uh, and Just Eat at the beginning of uh, 2018. 20. And then about March time, it was 90%. And uh, now it's uh, the equation has changed because we have learned some more stuff as well. Uh, but what I'm saying is that imagine if we were only re uh, relying on these aggregators, delivery Uber Eats and Just Eat, and uh, imagine if they then turn off, they, they're charging something like 32.5% or 35%. Wow. Yeah, wow. Uh, yeah, it's between 30 and 35%. Uh, and so, uh, but then they have, they have huge reach and without them, the businesses would not have survived as well. So it's got plus and minus points, but uh, there, has, there has to be a middle way. So uh, then what happens is you open up another store and then uh, there are no couriers for either of these uh, aggregators because you're relying on their drivers. They can switch you off. So you are off uh, the screen completely. And then what happens when your 90% of your business is supposed to come through the aggregators 
And they decide, not you, you're unaware of it. They decide somewhere sitting wherever that there are no couriers and for whatever reason they take you off offline. Then what do you do? So, so you have to be very, very, very much on the ball and learn to do deliveries and, um, and other avenues yourself as well. Otherwise you're doomed. Wow. Uh, Peter, what's your view of this subject, please? Oh, well, um, uh, I'm, I'm very much uh, of a similar opinion to Nilofa. The, the, um, the, the amount of money charged is uh, unsustainable, in my view, wow. for, uh, a, for a restaurant with a, uh, with a normal costing structure. The only way it can work is to turn yourself into a dark kitchen, which turns you into a completely different business. So I, I think that there are, there are some anomalies at the heart of delivery, which have got to be worked out. Because on the other side, uh, as both George and Lilith have said, there is huge demand for delivery. Mm. So how, how can the numbers be made to work, I think is, is a challenge for the future, for, and particularly for the delivery companies, people who are doing the delivery itself. Um, I wonder if I could just um, move the subject on a little bit. Um, and, and sort of talk about a little bit more about um, the future. Um, but before we do that, um, just a note on Brexit, um, bec because I've heard it's happening, uh, or something's happening anyway. Um, I don't know, George. Your do you have a, do you have any comments? Well, uh, uh, yeah. I guess at the end of the day, a decision will be made. Um, one way or the other, it seems to be swinging from no deal to maybe a deal, maybe not a deal. It's going to affect us all, whatever happens. Um, it's going to affect us uh, uh, whether we're going on a holiday or whether we're trying to build businesses, bringing product into the UK or sending it out into Europe. We all have to face up to this. Um, uh, it's very easy just to say it'll sort itself out. It, it won't just sort itself out. But I think the robustness of our importers and our exporters are you know, again, they, they realize that they're going to have to change. A lot of work, preliminary work has been done to be ready. Um, uh, uh, some, something will happen uh, uh, and we will all change. We've got to be strong negotiators. We've got to stand very firm with our customers. So if we have an added cost that's basically born from Brexit, we have to be very honest and very clear. I think what we have to be careful of those that try and capitalize a little bit more where it's not necessary. Um, but I, I think that we, we just have to be firm uh, and very clear um, not to compensate too much uh, and try and swallow very thin margins. Um, mm. I think we just have to be very honest with our customer base um, and, and face up to this. Um, it's gonna to be tough. It's gonna to cause a bit of difficulty. I think in January, we're already predicting late arrivals, poor quality produce, um, that's going to happen. Uh, I think we've just got to have our wits about us. Nilofa, um, mm. what's so, what going to mean for you? <laughs> so we started doing, Peter, we started doing our Brexit analysis uh, just recently when we had a tiny bit more of a bandwidth, really. And uh, at the moment, uh, our main uh, supplier of the meat is very uh, much UK-based. But uh, we were having conversation with him. This is the halal meat we get, and he said, uh, so far we, he does not see a problem. But then, when we don't know, he doesn't know himself. When it starts drying up in UK, the import that's coming from abroad, then what the current supplier would do, i.e., his wholesaler would do to him, uh, he says he doesn't know, and that that's one of the product, and then there are several others. So from that point of view, the supply chain is something that is a worry. And personally, I don't think we can do at the moment a lot about it. Uh, I mean, our, our fresh produce, it'll be great, but uh, to be speaking to George and others about that. I mean, but Brexit itself um, is something it's still unknown and we don't export anything. So from there, uh, uh, we don't get affected. We import, I, our uh, supplies, a lot of it is imported. So we'll have to wait and see what happens on that one. But holiday wise, there are beautiful places in UK. That's, that's <laughs> the least of our worry at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> George's yeah. farm, George's farm especially. George's is, it, farm? Is, it, is it true to say that 
for, for both Nilofar and Georgia's perspective, there's a lot of uncertainty still. Or yeah. from Georgia's oh, yeah. perspective, is there is that overstating the case? No, it's not. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of nervous nervousness. Um, we have, with some of our customers, done some contingency planning. Um, we've we've done a little bit of extra sourcing. Um, I, I think we just have to be be ready for whatever's ahead of us. Um, it is very uncertain. It is still very uncertain. And I think, you know, it will affect different businesses. You know, UK farming is quite exciting in a sense that, 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 that there's going to be more demand for British. I was talking to somebody yesterday who said, you know, we might even start to see more manufacturing being forced back into the UK, which won't be a bad thing. Um, I'm not saying that's going to happen in January first week, but over time, I think we're going to have to start reflecting and look inside this brilliant island of ours and start using it for what we used to do. And I think that might force some more um, manufacturing businesses. Mm. Uh, maybe that's can, a good thing. Can I just come in? I think also, Peter, it, at the end of the day, it also has to be a mindset of the consumers as well. Like in our case, uh, our and uh, the money comes from the customers, from the consumers. So consumers need also, if there's a price change, et cetera, if the prices are going up currently, if we go to any of the uh, local suppliers, the prices are high uh, of, of the produce as compared to say the wholesalers who are supplying us. And, uh, and that will, in effect, the businesses will have to raise their prices and then uh, will the customer the, at the end of the uh, road, will they be happy paying it? So, so it's, it's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of things we're still trying to see how it all pans out. Mm -hmm. Well, we've, we've got a couple of minutes left and um, mm -hmm. I, I really just got um, one, one sort of question I'd, I'd like to pose to both of our guests. Um, and that is thinking about the future what does success look like for you? Um, George, go on. You. What, what does success look like? I think success, in in the in the minimum sense, is sustaining what we've got, holding on to what we've got. Um, I think for me to look back in twelve months and say that we've successfully stayed running, um, obviously we're a bit more optimistic than that. Um, but I, I think success is, is retaining our teams, retaining um, all the people that have supported us over this period. Um, so, yeah, I think I think success is is continuing to help feed the nation uh, as cost effectively as possible, but giving the consumer in the end great value. Um, and that just may look a little bit different to how it does today. But but success is carrying on doing what we're doing and, and improving it. Uh and Nilofa, um, by, by all means, look for the next year, but also the next five years, for ha perhaps. Mm. What does success look like? So, Peter, for me, success comes in many different colours. Uh, one is uh, we would love uh, Zabadas to be a mainstream brand um, uh, in five years and beyond, and it's a legacy, a legacy brand. We would love uh, for that to happen. We would love uh, Zabadas to grow uh, as a uh, second generation ethnic brand to become a mainstream uh, big brand. So that, that in itself is a big success for us. And also to uh, grow so that our own teams and the teams with, uh, who have been with us, they can also reap the fruits uh, of all the uh, dedications and sincerity and loyalty that they have shown to the brand. So that, that in itself is a success. Uh, also to have a fine uh, Zabada's name alongside big names in the supermarkets and the um, travel hubs and airport. And this is all going, you know, the big, big, big vision to go UK and beyond. And that, that's, that's success. But in the same time, very much keeping our existing team, taking them along with us to become a mainstream brand. And that's what, and finding a partner who can really propel us up. That's what success looks like. That, that sounds like success. George, do, do you just want to put a, a five-year perspective on success? Yeah, I think, I, I think our success will be um, building our online business. Um, uh, inevitably, we, we see the market changing. 
So I, I would see in five years that we would be, let's say there's a big article in the grocer that says, well, the company is called 44foods.com, if I plug it for a second. 44foods.com is a collaboration of a number of suppliers of great food, um, great fi fresh fish, fresh meat and fresh fruit and veg and larder goods. Um, I think the success will be that we will be running deliveries nationwide um, and hopefully collaborating perhaps with some restaurants and some other food. Um, I think um, Neil Far and I will probably end up having a big chat after this because I think I've got Great. some ideas. Um, <laughs> I think success. she and I probably got a few ideas that we want to want to get our heads together. But um, you Did know, you I, I, I've got some um, some some great mm -hmm. ambition to. Yeah, to, to build that, that, that sort of platform and give um, some of those other big chaps a, a bit of a run for their money, shall we say. That, that's brilliant. And that's a really good um, point to, to finish the, this conversation. Um, I'd really like to thank both George and Neela for, for, for participating, for, for being so um, forthcoming and creative in what you've said. And thank you very much and if this was a, a room i would be asking for a round of applause <laughs> well thank you <laughs> yeah so, very good um uh, max thank do you, can i hand over to you now no no problem just let's let's keep um jordan on just as a, as we as we wrap up just just to give you a bit of context from our perspective uh, that uh, george especially you know on, on the on the brexit um subject um tomorrow we're, we're thursday we're running a big brexit broadcast it's uh, at two o'clock with some <laughs> Uh, pretty heavyweight uh, industry individuals um, and we're not trying to come up with solutions we just want a, a debate as to uh, where we are and, and as, as Peter's intimated what does success look like how can we work um, through this I don't know if um, any of you picked up on it but earlier this week um, uh, George uh, Minor Weir and Willis were in the in the grocer magazine saying about garlic that they've got two containers uh, of garlic on the water that were due to come into I think it was Felix though um, but the um, shippers aren't coming into the UK ports at the moment because of the um, amount of mass congestion. And that congestion has been caused by uh, companies over ordering um, for, for, for Christmas and other uh, dry goods or, or, or Christmas um, elements. But at Felix, though, we've got a, a big problem. Felix, there's only 40 minutes uh, to the east of me that there's uh, 11,000 containers on the dock side full of PPE unused that the government... Um, Brightly um, over ordered, and that's taken up a third of the of the um, of the space at Felix Day, so they can't get the containers in. So this gar uh, sorry, this ginger, this ginger that would, um, this company might have and Willis ordered is sat in Rotterdam, and they tried to get a lorry to go and pick it up uh, and bring it in, and that would normally take under a, a day. But because it's um, and George, you know better than I, because it's con um, it is uh, designated as a uh, as sea freight, it can't go in a lorry, so it's got to come on sea back. But it's not due to come back for the next um, three four weeks. And if you go into the likes of Sainsbury's as I did last night. Uh, out of curiosity you can buy ginger but instead of one pound fifty um, a piece it's now five pound a piece so we've seen a, a sharp escalation of, of prices in, in certain areas already uh, before we went live on this broadcast a, a contact um, from holland uh, phoned me and they're big suppliers to uh, likes of costco in the uk and do 22 large stores in the uk and costco is saying to them what are you doing about brexit and this dutch supplier is saying to them what are you doing about brexit and sainsbury's is also saying to that dutch supplier what are you doing about brexit and that dutch supplier is saying to sainsbury's what are you doing about brexit so we do need Clarity, try to be positive. Um, you, you would hope that once we get through the machinations of, uh, of early January, that will all, all clear out. So there will be some, some semblance of, of, um, of normality. That, that all aside, that getting back to the, 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 the subject today, Peter, I've, 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 I'm just so fascinated by these conversations. I've learned so much um, from, from, um, from both, both of our experts. And I can see how this, this revolution is, is occurring from the, the ground up with the, with the likes of Nilofar and, and, and George because of the disruption that they're, they're creating. And Peter, unless you say otherwise, I'm, presumably, I'm presuming you're seeing this within other food service sectors that people are resilient and they are changing and they are adapting. So there will be a brighter future for the food service sector come um, 2021 and beyond. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And what's been genuinely inspiring from, from what we've learned this afternoon is coping with truly awful conditions that were totally unforeseen. Um, you know, both companies immediately pivoted in another direction. Um, uh, um, George's company 
pivoting to retail, um, uh, Nilofar um, working with the NHS, you know, picking up opportunities. And then over, over the next few months doing fabulous stuff like opening a CPU, um, um, thinking creative, creatively, um, and, then, and then working with people and valuing people, um, employees, um, uh, suppliers and, and everybody else and I and, and th that's been really inspirational I have to say from this discussion but it's what I also hear in, in generally going around the food service market so I think there's tremendous um, hope for uh, the future um, really solid grounds and I, I'm hoping that using the word the industry um, is able to um, really learn the lessons that it's learned uh, and and b use that as a platform for really good things in the future. I'm hopeful. And, and uh, uh, we've got a great contact in the, in the States, uh, Todd, who's been uh, watching in. He's just stated in the States right now, some food service operations are thinking that, but, but that by May of 2021, that the restaurant industry will start to explode. Some claim by 200 percent pre-COVID numbers. So, so again, th those companies that are resilient have, have created a difference and uh, created a new foundation may look to potentially explode uh, pos positively come uh, spring, spring of, uh, of next year. Um, Everyone, we're just starting to, to run out of time, but we've got to end in, it's been a fascinating conversation, but we're definitely going to end on, on, a, on a positive note. Um, Nirfar, if we, we, if we were all going to come to yours for, for lunch, just quickly run us through the menu that you would select for us. If we said, we're going to, we're going to have whatever you're going to give us. We'll, right. we'll, pay, we'll pay, of course. So what, what, <laughs> no, no, Peter will pay. What, 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 right. what would you, what, what I, would you suggest? I would, what I would suggest is a homemade parathas with uh, chicken tikka and chicken sea kebab with grilled halloumi and lettuce, cucumber, tomato and uh, red onions and drizzled with tamarind and mango sauce. Those are the wraps. And then the biryani boxes will have your chicken biryani or the vegan biryani. And then there's a sauce that comes with it as well. And for dessert, I would recommend uh, gulab jamuns. So those, those are the, and then the vegan products are fantastic. So I would recommend that. Fantastic. Uh, George, Peter, I'll get the car. I'll pick you both up in 10 minutes and we'll, we'll go. George, what would you Lunch recommend? What, 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 George, what would you recommend for us to purchase from either Mud Walls or 40, 44 Foods, please? Uh, well, I, 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 certainly from 44 Foods, um, uh, I would definitely say let's let's get a, one of those brilliant Christmas boxes and uh, all those lovely Christmassy things and start to sort of enjoy ourselves. From mud walls, I'd 100% say purple sprouting broccoli every time. It is sensational. Um, as long as the asparagus season stays away till March or April, enjoy purple sprouting because it's just as good, actually a bit better. <laughs> Fantastic. Everyone, what, what a great note to, uh, to live on it. And just to say again, thank you very much for Total Produce PLC for being our partner on this and for Peter, Peter Backman, our, our resident uh, food service expert. Um, everyone, thank you very much. If we don't speak before, have a fantastic Christmas and keep safe. And we look forward to seeing the extreme positive growth of both of your, uh, your businesses in 2021 and beyond. Thank you. Season's thank greetings. you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Peter. Well done. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.